This episode is brought to you by my very own app, Fit by the Figure. If you're keen to start moving your body and fueling with nourishing foods, but are overwhelmed and not sure where to start, head to the show notes for your seven-day free trial. Welcome to Life with Danny Duncan, where we talk about everything from nutrition, movement and mindset to the bullshit that's been holding you back to live your best life, completely raw and unfiltered. I'm your host, Danny Duncan. I'm a featured nutrition and fitness coach, author, business owner, speaker, mum of three, including twins, and I'm going to let you into the behind the scenes of my life. Oh, and we'll have a bit of a laugh along the way, don't worry. It won't all be serious. I'm going to be the one to make you get uncomfortable with your reality and challenge you to make changes for good. So if you're feeling stuck in where you are in life and are ready to change, this podcast will unpack the reasons why you may be feeling this way and help you with tools to make changes in your life. There's no bullshit here, just real talk. So if you're ready, let's dive in. There's no time like the present. Hello and welcome back to Life with Danny and Duncan. Oh my God, we are getting to the pointy end of this pregnancy, guys. Harper has been back at school for a few weeks now and it's like Antarctica down here in Melbourne. It's birthday month in our house. Mine is the 12th of August. The twins are the 18th. Harper is the 30th. And we've also got a baby sprinkle and it's Father's Day. So a big month before baby arrives. So resting before this baby gets here is going to be a little bit interesting, but I will try and make some time. But I need to say thank you to you guys for all your amazing feedback on the podcast lately. I've had so many beautiful messages saying how all my different conversations are resonating with you, whether it's talking about fat loss and a zen pick and mindset or even just me and Chris giving you a bit of a giggle but um thank you so much but please continue to share and follow the more people we can reach with my message the better also while having a laugh so today is no different when it comes to an epic topic women's health is something I'm super passionate about it's not talked about enough either and it seems to also still be such a taboo topic so I have an awesome guest today who's going to make you feel so comfortable about all the bits and pieces you wish you knew earlier and men you might also like this, it might be actually very educational if you listen to this, uh, especially if you've got daughters. I know it might be a bit gross, but um, you should really understand this too. Just saying. Anyway, today I have Dr. LJ Hargraves. She is an osteo and clinic owner, certified personal trainer, has training and qualifications in pelvic health and prolapse management, and is a next level running gait assessor. And of course, a mum of three-year-old twins. She has over 11 years experience and a special interest in women's exercising, running, and staying active and strong through pregnancy and beyond. Just because you have kids doesn't mean you can't do it anymore. And if you're thinking about having kids, guys, maybe you're not there yet. We're going to talk through what you need to do to set yourself up for a healthy, active pregnancy as well and not pee yourself. She is passionate about educating women and empowering women in the pelvic health field, which is also such a taboo topic. And we're going to unpack all of these things today. We're going to bust some myths and get into the nitty gritty. And I can't wait. So hello. Welcome to my couch, LJ. Thank you very much (laughs) for having me. I feel very special. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. And I have a topic that I've had on my to-do list for this podcast for a while. You know, I incorporate it into my coaching and after having three babies and most of fourth, I'm very aware of stuff that goes on the pelvic floor. All of the pelvic floor. And I don't know about you, but once you have a baby, nothing's sort of off limits down there anymore. No, no, all dignity's gone. Literally. Like, I also find it funny when I go to my obstetrician, if he does ever do a vaginal examination, he still closes the curtain. Yes. I have women who have their pelvic floor examination. They take their undies off and fold it and put it under their pants. And I'm like... I'm going to see more than your under, you know, like, it's all good. Hang them up wherever. <laughs> totally. Like, that's discharge. Like, you know what is about to happen here? <laughs> I find it so funny. Like, you've had your arm up my vagina, Dr. Brilliant. You're closing the door. You're closing the door. <laughs> it's all about comfort. You can we stay. just want to make you feel comfortable. <laughs> oh, God. I think that, yeah, it literally goes out the window. So tell me. First of all, I have a question I ask all my guests, so I haven't prepped you on this one. But what is your unfiltered, laugh out loud, cringe moment? Oh, my God. So many. So many. I'm just so cringe. Probably less something I've done, but more what I say. So I I definitely live up to that kind of ditzy blonde with some of the comments that I make. Yeah. A couple that I can think of that come to mind when probably 10 years ago, I was just dating Sean and we were bowling and we'd done bowling and I'd knocked however many down and he goes, oh, you've only got four left. And I said, how do you know that? Because you can't see all the way down there. He goes, well, you've knocked down six. I said, how do you know there's still four left? (laughs) He's like, it's 10 pin bowling. <laughs> Hadn't occurred to me there was 10 pins. Like, I don't oh know. Oh, my God. You've just, just blown my mind. I, oh, I'm so glad it's not just Hang me. Hang on. <laughs> 10 pin. <laughs> Get out. 
<laughs> Ted Pimper. I'm so, okay. So maybe it's not as cringe. That is hilarious. Oh my god! I can't. Okay, so we're on the same page. Oh, yeah. I'm totally on the same page. Like, I would be would say with you. Yep. And to be honest, when I tell Chris this, feel... when I tell Chris this later, he's gonna be like, "What the fuck? You're is an wrong? idiot." But it's wrong with you too. <laughs> so yeah, in bowling, I mean, it was probably not as cringe as you thought then because no, you're I mean, too. I can see how it would be for someone that knew that. Everyone laughed. It's been a story that's been told for ten years now. But you know what's funny? Because ten pin. Mm-hmm. Is one word. Yeah. No, there's 10 pins. They're pins. There's 10 of them. Do you know I'm... <laughs> that podcast done. Oh, I, I... <laughs> Stuff the pelvic floor. Seriously? We're just best and miss here. I would love to know if anyone else didn't know that. Is it just us? Is it just us? <laughs> this is the thing. He's As you like, telling that you're story. very clever, LJ, but you're really dumb in life sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. When you were speaking, I was like, I'm confused. I don't I get what is... the cringe is. Yeah. And then you said 10 pin and I was like, the other one. Okay, I've got another okay. one for you. Maybe I'll find the other one for you. We were, you know, back in the day where there was no Google Maps and you had the mailways. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we were up in um, New South Wales and someone was like, yeah, you just get the Sidways. And I was like, Sidways, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's a Mel. It's Mel's Ways. It's a guy called Mel and he creates the map. <laughs> no. Sid, there's a Sidways. There's a Brisways. Melbourne. Mel is Melbourne, not a guy called Mel. <laughs> oh he knows the way to places. It's a Mel way. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> I knew that So one. maybe I'm a little bit extra cringe. <laughs> yeah, wow, you have actually blown my mind with the 10 pins. Oh, and I, I wonder now, I wonder if Chris knows that. I, I would suggest most people Let, do. I'm going to go check after. This is the best. Oh, my God. Okay, well, that was fun. That was oh really fun. Oh, my gosh. Well, we all have strengths in Yes, areas. exactly, exactly. Anyway, so you are an osteo first and foremost, and I didn't actually even realise osteos could look after women's health until you mentioned it in one of our sessions. So I want to ask two questions. One, what made you get into this area? And can you just sort of give us an idea of what the difference between an osteo and a physio is as well? So osteos have been treating women and women's pelvises for many, many years, mm. but it's only really new that we treat internally. Okay. So it was mainly physio, women's health physios yeah. that did the courses, and a lot of osteos weren't allowed to kind of go to those courses. And some osteos have started to trickle in. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of girls have got together and started the Osteopathic Pelvic Health Institute of Australia and started teaching it. Right. I was very lucky to become one of the first women to go to the first ever level one pelvic floor course with these ladies. Cool. So you will start seeing a lot more osteopaths within the women's health field. Yeah. Yeah, I've done my level one and I've done advanced prolapse. They've got lots of other courses that you can do as well. But that's kind of how I got into it. I only got into it though once having my twins, as you know, in 2020. And I kind of saw the lack of mixed knowledge on what you can and can't do during pregnancy. And even for someone in allied health, I was kind of like, can I, can't I, can I increase that? Should I stay the same? Should I breathe? Should I not breathe? Where am I at with my running, my exercise? Yeah, yeah. And for someone who's very active, I was like, I don't want to do anything wrong here. So that kind of got me into it. And then You know, I thought about all of the appointments you have for your bubba during your pregnancy and all the appointments you have after for your baby. And there's not a lot of appointments for you. So I was like, there's a missing link here and women aren't really getting the care I think they deserve during pregnancy and postpartum, particularly within reference to exercise. So Mm. I really was like, this is what I want to specialize in. in. Yeah. Um, I want to take more notice in. So ever since then, for the last four years, I've just been building how many courses that I can get in and learn and, and delve into it a lot more. Yeah, awesome. In regards to the difference between an osteo and a physio, Physios have been around for a lot longer than osteos. They've been within the pelvic health field for, God, I wouldn't even be able to tell you how long they've been in it. We're very similar. We're doing a lot of the same stuff. There's a couple of things that we don't do. That's fit pessaries. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a prolapse, you can get a pessary, which is kind of like a little device that goes up and holds up the prolapse. We don't fit those. So that's when I would definitely refer to a women's health physio. And I'm still happy to refer to women's health physios. They've been doing it for so much longer. But we take a real osteopathic view rather than just focusing on the pelvic floor you're a holistic person there's a lot more going on with your whole body than just your pelvic floor yeah so we kind of take into account everything as well yeah cool it is funny that you said before I know when I had Harper so I did all my study post Harper and even though I'm a dancer from way back I knew that we had to engage your pelvic floor from all the Pilates I've done but apart from that I had absolutely zero clue as to what that was and I remember a physio coming to see me at the hospital Mm -hmm not even checking my pelvic floor, yeah. just basically checking my abs aberration and then going, oh, you're fine. Yeah, you can run in this many weeks. See you later. Yeah. And then you have your six-week check with the doctor and 
I don't know, he definitely checked my vagina, but I don't think he was, I don't know what he was looking for. Yeah, I but, think a lot of that is based around healing as well, depending yeah. on whether you've had a vaginal or a cesarean. Yeah. Either way, your pelvic floor is affected and held up a bubba and all of, you know, your placenta, your amniotic fluid, all that extra fluid that's held up through nine months of a pregnancy, yeah. it's still under stress and yeah. under pressure. A lot of the six-week checks with GPs tend to be, have you healed? Have you, have healed? you got a tear? Yeah. Is that healing? That kind of thing, rather than the function. Totally. And this is the thing, I, obviously being in the allied health field, knew I need to go and see a women's health physio because that's all I knew at the time yeah. to get checked to make sure that I'm okay a lot of women don't know that no I get this six week check I didn't know this that. six week magical number where yeah. we go right I'm six weeks I, I can lift things now yeah. I can do this now yeah healing starts the minute you start giving birth oh totally so healing starts straight away and if more women knew that healing starts before you have a pregnancy yeah, yeah. yeah. you start getting on the which we'll talk about yeah we'll get to yeah but yeah the six weeks is this magical number the GP yeah she didn't even check me she just said ah oh, are you seeing a physio I said yeah okay yeah, I didn't even get asked that. And even with that physio that came in, to be honest, at the hospital, and this isn't their fault, but we should know this by now. Mm. I'm in no mental state 24 hours after having a baby to listen to someone to go. Like, I'm, I think she probably did say, you might want to see a physio in six weeks. Just, I Like, come on. I think that's the thing. I mean, I've only had one pregnancy and one birth of the twins. Yeah. That was the last thing I was thinking about. Oh. I was like, what has just happened totally. in the last 24 hours? Yeah. And I tried to listen because I was obviously an osteopath. I was like, oh, I'll try and listen to this. I remember I've got a handout. Yeah. That's all I remember. And they're doing yeah. a great job. They've got women physios in hospital yes. giving advice. It's a good but start. I think it needs to be more proactive and more known to everybody. Book in and see someone. It It'd is be a must. really you cool have to. if we could book in the hospital, right? Mm. Like, let's make your appointment now. Here's a list of people in your area that you can see. Yeah. Do it. Because yeah. 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 Um, it wasn't until I did my study after Harper. And I think it was maybe, I would say like three months after having Harper, I kind of was like, I feel like there's a little bit of a bulge out there, but I'm not sure what it is. Mm. It actually turns out I didn't have a prolapse. It was just the way my vagina was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. having a baby. <laughs> but I remember being at the doctor for a pap smear, I think it was, and mm-hmm. I'm just being like, can you just, or something else, can I remember being like, can you just check mm-hmm. and see? She's like, no, there's no, like, she's like, you wouldn't even know you had a baby. I was like, oh, well, t- <laughs> yeah, love that. I'll take that. You can still, the thing is a lot of women will have their baby and things can kind of feel normal and still a year down the track, it can not go backwards, but if you don't continue to work on it, yeah. it can actually regress as well, yeah, which I think sure. is a thing. Yeah. So a lot of women a year later kind of go, oh, this doesn't feel normal. Well, but I've had a baby ages ago. Yeah. It should be fine. But it's like anything, right? Like if you don't keep bicep curling, your bicep You've got to keep gonna, working it. Yeah, exactly. It's sure. a muscle like any other muscle. Yeah, for mm. sure. So for those who aren't sure out there, what different things are in this category of pelvic floor health and what are the most common symptoms? So when we talk about women's health and pelvic health, mm-hmm. what are we talking about? Mm-hmm. So I think it's important to know what your pelvic floor is. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people don't. Yeah. And as you mentioned before in your intro, men it's important to listen, but yeah. you've also got one. Yes, yeah? yes. So everyone's got a pelvic floor. It's anywhere that ranges between your pubic bone and all the way through underneath to your coccyx and sacrum, so the bone at the back, yeah. your saddle region, anything that sits right up in there when yeah. you're riding a bike, that's your pelvic floor. Yeah, right. A pelvic floor dysfunction can range from anything from pain through to incontinence, leakage, bladder bowel, and prolapse mainly. Yeah. You've got other things that encompass within the pelvic floor as well in terms of like abdominal separation, back pain, hip yeah. pain, groin pain, all that kind of stuff can come into it. Yeah. Um, but that's your pelvic floor. It's a group yeah. of muscles that sit there. They've got three holes in them if you're a female, two holes if you're a man. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and yeah, it holds everything up. So yeah. it holds your bladder up. The number one function of your pelvic floor is to keep you dry. Yeah. Okay. So if it's not keeping you dry, there's a lot of other stuff going on as well. Yeah. And I think okay. that's really important to know. There was an actual study done on, it was like a couple of hundred women, I think it was 2018, they had low back pain or pelvic pain. That Mm -hmm. was the two things that they came in with. Low back pain or pelvic pain, and pelvic pain was anything within the pelvis. And 95.3% of them had pelvic floor dysfunction. Yeah, wow. 95.3. They just had low back pain or pelvic pain. So it's heavily related to low back, Yeah. particularly men. So men might go, I've got a bit of sore lower back. It can be because their pelvic floor is either weak or overactive. Yeah, well, yeah. and they might not necessarily be leaking. Or they might not be leaking. Not. Men are less likely to leak than women. Yeah, particularly women who have had travel for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <Fair>. maybe not. <laughs> particularly from having obviously pregnancy or post birth as well, but yeah. it can happen pre babies too. So anyone yeah. who's not had a baby, yeah, mostly pelvic floor dysfunction is the most common. Would be signs and symptoms of a prolapse, heaviness, dragging, bulging, feelings of yeah. uncomfortableness in your knickers, depending on different levels within the prolapse. And then incontinence, leaking, when you're coughing, sneezing, bearing down and things yeah. like that, laughing. Yeah. And then pain. Yeah. Yeah. And I love you said it and also a few other physios have said it and I say it now all the time is that it's not normal to no. have those symptoms. It's common. It's common. Yeah. It's not normal. Yeah. And I think more women need to understand that because yeah. they go through life with these symptoms going, but I've had a baby. 
It's just how it is now. Yeah. It's not how it is. Yeah. It can change. Yeah. And you do like, I talk a lot about toxic empathy and like, Mm. this is another category it falls into. Mm -hmm. Like a woman will say, oh, I just swee when I sneeze now. And someone goes, it's fine. It's really normal. Yeah. Oh, us mums. Yeah. No. No. Not us mums. No. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. No. Mums need to be having just as much fun out there with their kids running and jumping and going to the bounce and all of the things with totally. their kids. Instead, they're sitting there while the dads do it because they're pissing themselves. Yeah. You know? For yeah. sure. It's, yeah. it's massive. Okay, so back pain. That's an interesting one, especially mm. in men mm-hmm. as well. Three holes and two holes. I yeah. just didn't even there know that. There you go. There you go. <laughs> we got an extra one. <laughs> Baby's out. There you go. Um, how many women will actually experience pelvic floor issues after having a baby? And what is the most common? Yeah, so... There's heaps of different data out there that include just incontinence or just prolapse or yeah. pelvic floor dysfunction in general. Mm-hmm. From what we're finding is more than 50%. Wow. More than 50%. So it's two of us in the yeah. room, at least one of us. Yeah. I can tell you I have. Yeah, well, I have. Pelvic floor dysfunction, so we've got 100% in this yeah. room. I think it's more than that and I yeah. think it's unreported because totally. women don't want to go to a therapist and don't want to talk about it. For sure. It's taboo. It's private. It's I don't want to talk about that. I don't mm. want to tell my neighbour that I'm weighing or my friend that I'm yeah. weighing. She's probably weighing too, for example. Yeah. yeah. And that's just in um, pelvic floor dysfunction in general. Okay. But I know we're going to speak about it, but even elite athletes, one in three elite athletes pre-babies wow. have got incontinence. That's yeah. one in three there, pelvic floor dysfunction, yeah. you know, not even having babies. Yeah. And why is that happening? With elite athletes and, and women pre-babies, a lot more of the time it's an overactive pelvic floor. Yeah. So it's not weak necessarily. It's overactive. So it's on all day. Yeah. So it's holding in, I think, as well with elite athletes, but not just elite athletes. So we're talking about general population, pre-babies and even post stress anxiety, Holy hustle, yeah. I'm going to do this and i got to do that and everything's holding on and our pelvic floor is doing this all day. Yeah. And I like to use the analogy that you're holding up a shopping bag all day with your bicep. Yeah. You've held it up all day, quite happy, and then someone puts a pint of milk in there. And you're like, a pint, a pint, a pint, a litre of milk in there. And much. your bicep <laughs> goes, stuff this, I've worked all day, your bag drops. Yeah. Same as your pelvic floor. Right. It's holding up all this stuff all day, holding in where you can't leak. And, and if, especially if you've got leakage, you've got it on all yeah. day, right? And then you sneeze. <laughs> Yeah. Now I'm done. And with that whole thing, I was just thinking sort of back to my ballet days actually where sometimes you would hold on and yep. not go to the toilet because you don't want to leave class. or on, 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 on. Yeah, that can contribute as well. Oh, so God. what's really important around the pelvic floor is getting it checked firstly yeah. by a women's health osteophysio to check is it weak and not contracting or is it overactive and it's on all day and do you actually need to downregulate it mm. and relax it and lengthen it? It's yeah. the same as any other muscle. Yeah. To get the full work out of your bicep, it needs to, you know, contract and relax. And relax it's the yeah. same with your pelvic floor. And a lot of us aren't lengthening it. We've yeah. got to lengthen it and downtrain it yeah. and not just have it on all day. Yeah. And then when you talk about a prolapse, do you want to talk through, because I know for me initially I thought I had a bladder prolapse because I thought that's what the only thing, but there's three different types, is it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So so you've got three holes. Should yeah. have bought my diagram. Yeah. You've got three holes, poo hole, yep. vagina hole. We hole. Yeah. And um, once you've obviously had a baby and the baby's come through the vaginal canal or, or not, it can be cesarean as well, but there's just a lot of pressure down. You yep. can get an anterior prolapse, so a cystocele, which is from the urethra or, or the bladder coming okay. forward into the vagina, or a rectocele, which is rectal, yep. yeah, coming through. And you can also get a uterine prolapse. So your uterus can prolapse down okay. centrally. Yeah. So I'm just going to c- circle back for a second. When you said three holes, of course I know I have three holes. I didn't realise, though, that they would go into the pelvic floor. This yeah, is so your what, pelvic this floor. This is what baffled me just yeah. then. So your pelvic floor, think of your pelvic floor as like a little sling. It's a little sling holding everything up. And like how do you get wee out? Yeah, it needs right. to go through the hole in the pelvic floor. So you've actually got a left side and a right side yeah. to your pelvic floor. You've also got a front and a back. So a lot of women, when we talk about pelvic floor contraction, may be able to contract around the urethra and hold wee in. Yeah. But they're, they're forgetting about... The one at the, the back. back. Yeah. And they might like be leaking said three gas holes. Or... I was like, okay, then now it's making sense they're connecting to our holes, which because obviously I knew we had three You've holes. You've got your pelvic floor, yeah. urethra, vagina. You're rectum, right. And anus through there. Yeah. Holes. Yeah. There you go. And left and right. So people can be overactive or tight at the front, but weak at the back. So yeah. when I do my examinations, I'm looking at where can they contract and which part can they actually contract. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. Oh, God, this is like only mine. coaching yeah. session. <laughs> I know that this is potentially why people do struggle. Like what is common practice when they come and see you? So someone's sitting there going, oh, my God, this is me. I've got this leaking up, bulging. I've got lower back pain. Hopefully people listening going, yeah, okay, I need to see someone. Mm-hmm. But what the fuck is actually going to happen when I <laughs> – Yeah, this is a really good one. And this is probably the main reason why women don't come because they're just apprehensive. Yeah. 
it's a private area. Like yeah. some people have only had their partner see it. Some people have never looked at their own. Yeah. yeah. And I know we've spoken before about your vulva and what it looks like and yeah. taboo around talking about it. And yeah. there's a lot of self-consciousness around what your vulva looks like. And I wish I could tell people, well, here, anyway, I will. I'll tell people. Tell people now. I'm telling you now, <laughs> everyone's vulva is different and yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Everyone's different. Like our faces are different, our bodies are different, our vulvas are different. And I think if we all from a young age, do you know labiaplasty, mm. surgery to your labia? Yeah. Yeah. The average age of women and girls that are presenting to hospitals looking into labiaplasty is the what, average don't, age. Don't tell me. It's going to be ridiculous. 14. <gasps> Stop it. 14. Do you know that makes so much sense? It though? makes me feel sick. It, that, it does. Because that's not just girls. That's that's us. That's yeah, parents that's as well. Parents. Not being educated themselves. So and it's not, not their fault. They've not been educated and yeah. understand. And then they're not really educating their kids. Everybody's is different. No. And it's not an issue. Unless it's a medical issue, you've got some rubbing or 14. something like that. 14. So because I have to say, like, this is going to be such, I mean, we're talking about new vagina, so who let's be honest with that. Let's God. overshare. We let's do it. Mm. In the ballet world, you're seeing a lot of naked people mm -hmm. in change rooms and things like that. And there's always a lot of comparison. Mm. Oh, my God, look at her vagina. Naturally, look there is. Her vagina. Mm. Look at her vagina. But I think you're right. Like, because I feel like our generation and maybe prior generations, well, prior generations probably weren't actually looking at anyone else's vagina, but our generation maybe were the first generation mm. where we did see potentially other people's mm -hmm. vaginas mm -hmm. or vulvas and yeah. the whole area. Vulvas. Vulvas. Vulvas, yeah. Yep. Uh, which is another misconception, yeah. right? People call it a vagina. Actually, it's a vulva and a clitoris and, a, and like, labia. Like A little girl's three. Like, Dad, my vulvas. Yeah. Sean's like, oh, God. We use the collective noun of Fanny. So that's the collective noun for the area. And cool. then we have our parts. <laughs> like, half will be like, oh, I shouldn't like, my clitoris. Oh, so, but that's great. It's great. I yeah. need to know that. That's yeah. awesome information. The collective noun is Fanny. It needs to be specific, but collective Fanny. Yeah. Collective vulva. Collective vulva. Yeah. And I remember being sort of in situations and then if someone did feel like theirs was different mm -hmm. because the conversations at home weren't everyone's different like mine like you know even in the shower now and I don't remember having these conversations like this with my mum really maybe a few but again she's a doctor so she was educated in this yeah. area she was yep, in yep, a lot of yep. vaginas mm -hmm. so the conversations were probably better from my perspective yeah. but if you haven't got a parent having those conversations with you like even now half in the shower be like mummy she said the other day mum why is your vagina so dark and big. And I was like, well, I'm pregnant. And it gets darker when you're pregnant. <laughs> it's darker so when you're pregnant. Nipples. And more so, swollen. You know. <laughs> I was like, usually it's like a flower, honey. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but um, I think this is it. We need to talk about it. Yeah. We need to be like, open and talk about it. All vaginas are different. Yours is different. Tahalos. Everyone is going to be different and they all grow in different shapes and sizes, totally. just like you do with your friends. Yeah. You're quite a small person. Yeah. Your friends are taller than you, just like that's that. That's it. And that's what I kind of use when I talk yeah. to people. Everyone's face is different. My nose is different to yours. My ears are different to yours. My eyes are different yeah. to yours. But my vulva is different to yeah. yours. There's no normal or abnormal. I think they're all beautiful. They're all individual. They are the persons. Totally. I'll also say that as a pelvic health practitioner, I've forgotten what your vulva looks like the minute you leave. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a couple of patients on. and a couple of friends who have kind of been like, oh, there's no way. There's no way I could have you do a pelvic floor on me. You'd never look at me the same. No. Nah. I'd remember you and your function. I'd remember what exercises I gave you and I'd remember how it's affecting your life. Yeah. But I've forgotten what your vulva looks like the minute you've looked out because it's the least important thing to me. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So with what kind of goes on in, in my treatment room, um, people booking for a pelvic floor appointment. Yep. I've normally taken a pretty detailed medical history. I've asked all the questions. Yeah. I'm an oversharer yeah. by nature and I want them to overshare with me. I want yeah. poos, I want wheeze, I want what does it look like, how many, how long Sex. does it flow, how's happening, give me all the things about yeah. the intimacy, what's happening yeah. with um, kids, all those things are really yeah. important. That's another thing that people don't talk about. We don't talk about intimacy and yes. that's massively important in pelvic floor. Totally. Pelvic floor, back and forth. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll that. Making them feel comfortable is my most important thing. Yeah. I want them to feel comfortable with me yeah. and I want to ask all the questions. The reason I'm asking the questions isn't to be nosy. I'm asking it so that I can form a plan to help them yeah. with their function. Yeah. So I get all of that information. We talk about it. I've got my models and my diagrams and all my things. I get them on the table and I do my assessment. So my assessment is firstly observations. How much detail do you want me to go into here? Go into details. Go yeah. Nuts. I just observe. So what I'm looking for. Pants is, off, I'm getting my off. Yep. So de I'll be closing the curtain. I've left, I've left the room <laughs> while you de robe because I just like to give women, once I've had a couple of people in for a couple of times, they're just whipping in because they don't worry talking. about leaving. Fine, it's not a waste right? time. <laughs> so exactly, right? So I get out, I let them de robe, pop, pop themselves on their tummy. They hide their knickers under their pants. <laughs> and um, I come back in and again, continuing to get consent and make sure that they're comfortable. Yep. 
external assessment first. I'm just looking for like lumps, bumps, redness. Women don't look at their own vulvas. Yeah. I didn't until I had kids and yeah. I looked at it and went, oh, my God, yeah. what is that? Yeah. <laughs> Women don't look at it. and It's like stranger things. Yeah, it, yeah, right. Literally. So their partners might look at it or they might not look at it. Maybe oh. they do. Maybe they shut their eyes. Maybe they – I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, right? But a lot of people aren't giving you feedback on that. So if you've got a lump on your arm, you're going to go, oh, what's that thing on your arm? Yeah. You've got a lump on your vulva. You're going, oh, no one's seen it. Is, is there a spot there? Totally, like, yeah. So I'm looking for observations, redness, swelling, all that kind of stuff. I get them to do activation while they're there so I can see if they're actually getting a rise of their pelvic floor so I can see that from the bottom. And then I'm looking to see also any, like, scars – from either pregnancies or tearing or anything like that, episiotomies and yeah. things, to see if that's yeah, right. in their function also because you've got higher rate of having pelvic floor dysfunction if yeah. you have had any interventions such as episiotomy, yeah. tearing or forceps for yes. example. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Bob Yeah. 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping it's around the right way now because that one's for each other. Get that head down, baby. No, it's, it's, it's good. <laughs> and then I do my internal assessment. So once I'm doing my internal assessment, I either place one or two fingers inside and that's when I get you to contract, relax, things like that. I get yeah. you to do a couple of different exercises. Yeah. Can you bring it up like an elevator and release it like an elevator in sections? Yeah. This is all just giving me more information. Check for prolapse if they've questioned that. So I get them to do different activities while um, and you look at it. Like I'm looking. Look so I've real. I've got my head right there looking because I need to be able to visualize if yeah. things are coming up or things are coming out. Um, yeah, there's different right. levels of prolapses. Some prolapses happen internal and you can't see them. And the further they get down, they can be hanging out and quite obvious. Yeah. But a lot of women, it's not hanging out. So you no. can have a prolapse, but it's higher up and it's causing you dysfunction. Yeah. Yeah. And then I also do that standing because as you know, yeah. Yeah. gravity takes hold when you're standing up. And a lot yeah. of women don't cough when they're sitting and wait. It's when they're standing yeah, up. Yeah, of course. So I yeah. them standing up. And yeah, I also then go in and map out, map out your pelvic floor muscles, what's tight, what's eliciting pain, is that your familiar pain, etc. Treat that if we need to. So yeah. just the same as you would a tight shoulder muscle for your neck, I go in and treat your pelvic floor wow. muscles. And uh, can you feel, you know how before you said there's a front and back and side and a side? Yeah, I can, can you feel? Like, feel which one's activating. And then I can cue them as well. This is why I really, I really like love what I do. Because when I went to my pelvic floor physio, it, was, it felt very focused on my pelvic floor muscles, but holistically our whole body's involved. Yeah. So when I have got, an internal examination mm. i'm feeling their breathing i'm yeah. feeling their abs i'm feeling their adductors i'm feeling their hips because breathing's hugely important yeah. in pelvic floor yeah. a lot of women we do it the opposite way oh yeah you know we, yeah. as you breathe in it goes down and relaxes yeah a lot of people breathe in and go yeah and try and turn it on yeah. but you're fighting against gravity yeah. you're doing and i talk a lot about that yeah, yeah. so it's doing it wrong totally yeah the majority of women come in and wouldn't have a clue no yeah when i do my breathing exercises i'm not sure if you've seen on my story mm. especially during pregnancy i share it more yeah Women are like, hang on, I'm contracting on the out breath. Mm. I'm like, yes. Yes. Yeah. And they're like, that seems so opposite to what I've, and I'm like, I know. Can, it's, yeah. You want to. <laughs> it's counterproductive yeah. if you're holding it in and breathing in because yeah. your diaphragm and pelvic floor are connected. So as your oxygen comes into your lungs, air comes into your lungs, your diaphragm goes down to allow it, intra abdominal pressure increases, pelvic floor goes down. Yeah. It naturally lengthens. Yeah. And then as you breathe out, everything comes back up again. Yeah, so perfect. when you're doing your pelvic floor exercises, it's important to use breath. So I'm checking all of that. Yeah, cool. There was another study about Kegels. So if someone had pelvic floor dysfunction and you were trying to heal it, there was four different groups. Pelvic floor contractions only, adductor squeezes yeah. only, roll-ups, abdominals only, and then a group doing all three. Okay. Best results came from the group. Pelvic yeah. floor doesn't work by himself, no. by herself. So the combined group, the group that had the least improvement was just the pelvic floor. Oh, so kegels are out. Yeah. Stuffy kegels, don't be doing them at the traffic lights. Yeah. Have an assessment and find out what you need to be doing for your yeah. pelvic floor. And I think you just said something like like crunches, like a crunch, right? Mm-hmm. Like an ab roll up. Ab roll up. Yeah. Like when I had Harper, it was still a no-no. Mm. Don't do a roll up, don't do a crunch. Mm-hmm. After a not good, mm. you know. And I remember thinking, but when I crunch... I am able to now bring my ribs together. Mm. I'm able to close my abdominals. Right. I'm doing it properly and slowly. Mm-hmm. Surely this is helping mm-hmm. everything. And then I know a few years ago it's now come it's out. All cha- it's yeah, all changed. Yeah, it's changed now. Abdominal yeah. contractions are important. I think, I think the thing is is that probably back then the majority of people were doing it wrong. Yeah. So they were like, oh, well, all of our examples aren't working. It's, it's causing more pressure down. Yeah. And I think a lot of the time it does. Yeah. Because when we're all, again, breathing and doing our roll up, we're actually pushing down and putting more pressure yeah. in that pocket. because we're doing it the wrong way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's so much education needed in this area. Yeah, oh, so much. God. Yeah. And no, I love it, but we just um, we just start in schools. Like all the stuff you and me both talk about. We need to be educating girls young. Totally. Yeah. yeah. What it is and it's not taboo and talk about it. Yeah. I was literally, it's so funny that you said that just then. As I was dropping my kids at my mum's just then. Yeah. Ayla goes, I'm holding my wee in, mum. I said, oh, are you? I'm waiting to get to Lala's house. I said, okay. I said, do you know what muscles are holding in your pelvic floor? Mm-hmm. 
Rolling in your wing, your pelvic floor. Pelvic floor. <laughs> I love this. I'm educating you early. Yeah. And like even things like, I mean, I talk a lot about menstrual cycles and yeah, hormones totally. and all that kind of stuff. We just need to be, because imagine if we went into a classroom at 12. Mm. I don't know if it's too young. If you're saying that most people are getting labiaplasties at 14, you know, we need to maybe year seven, like first year mm. of high school. And actually just make it a bit fun. Like this is a vagina. Yeah. This is it. Before it was like, we're going to talk about women. You now it's like, I think we're just going to be like, here's a vagina. You've all got one. Yeah. And they look like, and show pictures. They look like this. They look like this. They look like this. They look That's like it. you know. That's it. And show it to the boys as well. That, it needs to be both. One hundred percent needs to be both. Yeah. But I think there needs to be that element of separation that girls need to talk about it within girls because a lot of it comes within comparison yeah. of us. And I mean, even in our generation, my generation, our generation, yeah, like. You didn't look just in case it was like, oh, I would just love if not, not that we're all having full of puppies. I <laughs> sure look like. But I just wish people there was more yeah. representation of lots of different ones. Even yeah. in anatomy books, all of the totally. they all look the same. It all just looks the fucking same. Yeah. It's not the same. No. There's big bits, there's long bits, there's short bits. There's, totally. You know, yeah, yeah, everyone's just different. And I think yeah. that then impacts on our mental health as children, as, especially young women. Mm-hmm. It definitely impacts on your yeah. mental health because if you think you're different or you're getting judged for something and, oh, my God, I don't want her to know that I've got a bigger labia or, yeah. you know, it's like it's fucking normal. So, and this is it, right? And I think this, you've kind of just made a point. This is my biggest purpose behind why I do what I do because your pelvic floor, it affects everything. Yeah. If your pelvic floor is dysfunctional and you've got leaking or pain, pain during intimacy, pain going to the toilet, constipation, constantly wearing pads when mm. you're going out, it affects your social life, it affects your friends, it yeah. affects your relationships, it affects your mental health. Yeah. It might have an effect, I mean, you said a relationship, but like, your ability to actually be comfortable with a man. Absolutely. You know, if mm-hmm. you're like, well, if you think from comparison from being a child, you know, nothing looks right down there and something's wrong with it, you know, that could stop you from... Absolutely yeah. forming relationships with yeah. anyone and being comfortable in it. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. So is there ever a time that it's useless or like there's no point trying? Like I may as well try to fix it. I hear so many women, especially those in the older community like I do have clients in my 50s and 60s and even 70s and say things like oh I had kids it's just the way I used to wait till you're 60 it's too late like oh it's too much work now like but is it ever like it is never yeah too late okay to improve function yeah yeah. Do you want me to say that louder for the people in the back? For the people in the back. It's so it can never be fixed. too late to improve function. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Your pelvic floor is a muscle, just the same as any other muscle. Yeah, right. You tear another muscle, you can heal it. Yeah. Yeah. Never, ever. I work with women in their 70s who have come in who are wearing pads preventatively, decreasing their amount of fluid that they drink when they know they're going into the city on the train because yeah. there's not a toilet and things like that. That's real. As again, yeah. common. Not okay. normal. Yeah. I want women not wearing pads and going, yeah. no, I can hold that because I'm strong. And I yeah. can hold that bladder. And I've helped them completely take away yeah, wow. um, their pads. Now, even with some of these women, I've not done internal. I've just changed their breathing and body yeah, mechanics. Wow. I've got them to actually be in tune with their pelvic floor, switch it on, get in sync with it and go, oh, I was activating that all wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is 70-year-olds. Yeah, wow. You know? Because, I mean, I think especially that generation – didn't talk about it. No, absolutely not. And it was My zero mum was help. mortified when I was doing a pelvic floor course. She's yeah. like, what do you mean? Do you just look, what What do you mean? I was like, oh, well, you've got to look at each other's and you've got to put your finger in there and you've got to figure out what's going on and that's tight and that's there. And you do that in a course and you're all in a room. Yeah, well, we had to practice on each other. We had to learn. Yeah. That that blew her much. Oh, I can't believe that. Yeah. Oh, I'd be mortified. Mortified. Nah. Yeah. Shh. Get it out. Totally. And it's so funny because obviously these women have babies. I mean, I'm 40 next year, 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And to be honest as well, you see it on the TV though, the ads for the pads. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that normalises mm-hmm. leakage, right? Leaking into your older. Yep. Come and get this pose, mm-hmm. whatever this pad. The second biggest reason for women to be put into old people's homes, nursing homes, yeah. is incontinence. Yeah. The second biggest reason they wow. put people in an old people's home because they can't hold their bladder. Yeah. There's so many things that we can yeah. be doing. And again, it doesn't have to be an internal. It can be just connecting, getting strong, all the stuff that you do. Yeah. Switching your core on, getting totally. strong squats. Yeah. Like just being strong, physically active. I can't, yeah. you know, talk well, about it anymore, how important it is to be active. To active, yeah. Mm. I had a client, she probably wouldn't even mind me saying her name, Bindi last year, came and did my course. And it was so funny. She's like not into social media at all. She's like, she's been on social media for two years. And I was like, the, she told us three people and I was one of them. And she's like, I just have to give you a call. She was the funniest, most beautiful human. And she's like, I have the worst fucking prolapse. Like she was right out there. She's like, I am like bulging out like a, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, are you seeing someone? And she was like, no. Yeah. And so 
before I was like, you can come and do my course, but you've got to promise me you'll see you someone. Go see someone. Yeah. And it's still it's a long process for her. It's because a top, it's really, it, is, it was really bad. Depending on the level it is. If you've yeah. got a grade three prolapse and it's sitting, you know, it's sitting in your knickers and you can feel it every yeah, day, which it does, can. it will take a long time. But I mean, as with anything, you know, as you talk about, yeah. it's long sustainable change. Totally. It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. I'm not just gonna give you five exercises and you're not paying yourself within yeah. a week. You'll find changes. Oh yeah. But it can sometimes take one, two, three. I mean, look, nearly four years postpartum now, and I, even in this field, I sometimes I'm hard on myself because it's taken me four years to yeah. rehab my pelvic floor. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to get back into sprinting after one year, and I know you want to talk about exercise yeah, and pregnancy yeah. as well, but I've always been a sprinter, and I wanted to get back into it. All these other women had been in the sprinting yeah. and been back into it, and then um, they oh, but they've had one baby. I had two, so I kind of was like, oh, it'll take me a bit longer yeah. because I've had two. Yeah, and then my friend had twins who's a sprinter yeah and she's already back into it racing devo i was yeah. like comparison stop comparing don't stop i don't no. know her pregnancy i don't know her delivery i don't know how her pelvic floor was before no. it's your own individual thing and it takes time i'm four years now and i'm finally getting my shit together yeah. and i've figured out how to work for me for my pelvic floor for your pelvic mm. floor and that's yep. the thing it's like working within your yep. means right everybody's different everyone's yeah everyone's vulva's different everyone's pelvic floor muscles are different totally. and what your function is yeah. yeah and i know like Vindy, my client she's on the app she's doing you know, she's on there all the time i see her come up and i'm like she's like yeah it's good she's like yeah there's definitely things i have to do a little bit differently also down totally like, but she's, modifications modifications fine. is fine mm-hmm. yeah totally i mean it's funny because obviously yeah, you've had two babies four years ago mm-hmm. almost so i had harper and then as i said there wasn't really much between harper and the twins mm-hmm. i didn't really notice anything i felt like it was a little bulging but she like they were saying they were saying it's fine and yeah. to be honest there was no i didn't notice anything different when it came to intimacy or anything after the twins i only had bow vaginally and then harlow was a cesarean but it was between <laughs> god girl <laughs> i don't know and I think I didn't run with Harper. Yeah. I was pregnant with Harper. Yeah. So that um, was your first and you didn't know and you just thought we well, were doing it. Yeah. And I had yeah. a miscarriage before and yeah. I was like, oh, that's why I miscarried, which we fucking know now has got nothing to do with it. Yeah. I should have just run. But anyway, yeah. I didn't run. But I did run with the twins, which yeah. is a lot of pressure yeah. with two babies inside you up until 31 weeks. Yeah. And so I did find after Bo's vaginal birth, I was and I did do a half marathon 16 weeks postpartum after the twins. I didn't have any sort of nothing. I yep. had no issues, which was great. But I'm guessing that I was probably doing a lot of more work in that 16 weeks because I knew I had the run. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until after that that I started noticing yeah. some symptoms and then running faster. So we'll talk about exercise. Yeah. Running faster, obviously, yeah. I guess it yep. has an issue. If you want to eat better, move more and just feel your best but are not sure where to start, does the thought of going to a gym literally feel impossible? Introducing Fit by the Figure, your one-stop shop for holistic health, movement and nourishing foods the whole family will actually eat. Head to the show notes for your seven-day free trial. Yeah. Before we talk about exercise, what if you haven't had children? Because there are a lot of people that listen to my podcast that mm. don't have kids. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of time people think that pelvic floor issues is from having children. Mm. What is the risk of pelvic floor issues if you haven't had children? Well... Once again, we've all got pelvic floors. Yeah. And I mean, I know people, young people, this is, I mean, 10 years ago when I was on an overseas trip and they were only young and they, every time they laughed, they would wee. Yeah. They'd never had a kid before. They're yeah. only in their early 20s. Yeah. So it can definitely affect women who aren't pregnant or having babies. Yeah. But I would suggest a lot of that may be overactive okay. pelvic floors yeah. again as well. Yeah. Um, depending different sports people, as we spoke about before, yeah, yeah. you know, a lot of weightlifters, a lot of gymnasts, a lot of everything's yeah. kind of on and tight and it can be overactive. Yeah. But I think maybe not pelvic floor dysfunction, but can't actually activate their pelvic floor properly. So have never really put it under stress before. Yeah. So getting them to do their pelvic floor and connecting to it, connecting their breath and being as strong as possible. Yeah. It's going to minimize their risk of having pelvic floor issues, but it definitely can happen whether you've had a baby or not. Totally. Mm. And then if we're going into pregnancy, so if you're thinking about having a baby, mm. how important is it to prepare your pelvic floor for Absolutely. pregnancy? Absolutely. That would be my number one piece of advice Yeah, is get in tune with your pelvic floor and strengthen it before you even think about having a baby. Yeah. Don't wait till you're pregnant. And if you are pregnant now, it's not too late. You can no. continue to get it strong whilst you're pregnant. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's why I work with women through preconception as well. Yeah. Like, I would like to get pregnant. What do I have to do? Yeah. I'd be like, all right, let's get you yeah. strong. I feel like yeah. that's another little, I mean, we could talk about this forever, but I can we? So I feel like that's another area that we don't have enough information about like mm. especially i don't know i was one of the first people in my friendship group to have a baby same and i feel like going into pregnancy is like oh let's get pregnant we have to just have sex <laughs> yeah that's it take yeah. some prenatals and nope have sex there's a lot to it and obviously there's you know infertility issues and stuff like that as well in the link between pelvic floor and infertility oh. i've got not a clue no but you spent your whole teenage years and 20s trying not to get pregnant Seriously. <laughs> 
we'll get pregnant and easy. Oh, this is a lot harder than I thought. Totally. Yeah. Oh my God. All that freaking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So your top tip prenatally so have, mm-hmm. would be get in tune with it. Yep. See a physio or just. Yeah. If you want, why not? Like, yeah. I mean, if you feel that you can't connect to it, because I mean, as I said, a lot of women aren't contracting it properly yeah. and are going counterproductive to what it is. So they're breathing in and turning it on. Yeah. Pilates as well has become very yes. popular and a bit of a craze, which is a great craze yeah. because Pilates is awesome. Yeah. But I think I've been to a couple of Pilates classes in bigger business settings and the breath can be wrong. The activation can be wrong. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, I don't know if that's how you're supposed to do it. So I think if you go to a public floor Osteo, physio, yes. public floor practitioner who can actually advise you on how you're doing it and where you're contracting. Yeah. Again, yeah. The anterior, the posterior, a big thing. Oh God, it's not off topic. Constipation. Yes. A lot of women suffer constipation. One of the number one biggest things that can yeah. make you have pelvic floor dysfunction because you're straining to get poos out. Yes. And it can be if you've got an overactive pelvic floor and you yeah. to constipation and yeah. so vice versa. And could it be the opposite as well? I've stopped labeling myself with IBS now because I don't believe. Mm. Oh, whole nother conversation. But whole nother conversation. Whole nother conversation. But I do believe IBS is actually linked to your diet. Yeah. And stress levels. So mm-hmm. now that I've sorted most of them, <laughs> yeah. Maybe not my stress levels. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but my diet, I feel I've that she have not It's that. changed. It's yeah. changed. But Absolutely. back when I was younger, in my late teens and twenties, sometimes I'd be on the toilet a lot. Mm-hmm. So just coming out. So then I, I, I have to be straining to hold it in sometimes. Yeah. Is that another? Oh, that can. That's a whole different ball game. You've yeah. got. I could go deep into your different sphincters that you've got you know and and you've got your external and your internal and your external is trying to go where are we are we safe are we not the internal is trying to hold on it can be pelvic floor related but can also literally be irritation of your bowel and that the nerves going to the brain going i've got to get out now like depending on consistency of stool yeah obviously more fluidy consistency of stool is going to come out a lot easier so you can leak but that definitely fecal leakage and um, urinary incontinence yeah both can so fecal you know, leakage is also yeah absolutely yeah. gas leakage fecal leakage people can't hold a farting yeah that kind of stuff so yeah. they're embarrassed I mean not sometimes we can't hold a fart. absolutely sometimes we get better out than in as <laughs> yeah. they say but you know you've got a woman at the shops who bends over to get something and does a little oh. pop off and they can't hold that in you yeah. know yeah okay and then during pregnancy I mean I mm-hmm. obviously do a lot of work on my app as well mm-hmm. and you know it's funny because like you were just saying about the Pilates I don't know if you've ever done any of my workouts but literally yes. I, talk, I talk about it consistently yeah. like take a deep breath in on the out breath contract, contract. It. Yeah. before exactly we do any right. no, I've done them I've done your work I've done <laughs> yeah. the Pilates yeah, yeah. No. and that, that kind of cueing is important but yeah. just getting strong and I mean even exercise during pregnancy the research is all different as well well not different it's getting a lot better yeah it used to be you've not done it before don't do it yeah no no. Start. You can always start when you're pregnant. Yeah. You start at different levels. Totally. You, you gradually yeah. get into it. You yeah. don't start at advanced. If you've never ran before, you might not go straight to running, but you can absolutely go to strength training. Totally. And your app is the perfect platform for women to be starting because you've got all different levels, yes. you know. Yeah. If my number one piece of advice, be active. Yeah. Get yeah. strong because that is for pregnancy outcomes, you've got less risk of tearing. You've got less risk of longer pushing stage, which can yeah. cause a lot to your pelvic floor. Yeah. If you are stronger, you're able to contract it and relax it and you're strong through your hips, your back, your core. You've got better outcomes throughout your birth too. Yeah. Mm. It's actually funny you say that because I was talking to my bestie this morning. She is now a midwife, but she used to be a ballet dancer. So she was in the Australian ballet. She was a very, very good dancer. She was top of her game and completely different field. And when she had her baby, Velasco is, oh God, seven right now. I remember her also saying that her midwife said to her, gosh, we love a strong woman because we know how to push, right? And both my births, the midwives have said that to me, like, gosh, we love a strong woman because we know how to push. How to push, yeah. You know, I think half her was five pushes, but mainly because she was posterior. She had a bit of a hand. I was literally like three pushes and he was out and no assistance. Yeah. And all because I knew how to push. I yeah. obviously, I was, I was a very strong woman. You knew how to relax it as well. And I knew how to you relax, how to relax yeah. it. So when that, you know, in between the contractions as well, right? Mm-hmm. And Lana was saying this morning, she's like, Dan, she goes, it's nothing better than a woman like that. She goes, but I have, I have women that have babies and they have no idea how to push or contract or mm-hmm. they think they're pushing, but they're actually holding on. And this is the down training. So this is the overactivity of it. There's sometimes I think a nervousness, especially if you have had any incontinence or any leakage, you hold it on because you're like, well, I have to because if I let it go, then I could wee. Yeah. But it's the ability to kind of let it go when you don't need to use it. So if I'm sitting here right now, it shouldn't be being contracted. No. It doesn't need to be. No. But when I take a step to leave your house yeah. or when I go to lift my newborn up or yeah. whatever it is, I need to be able to turn it back on again and use it. To yeah. Adequately have a less traumatic vaginal birth as well. You have to be able to have that 
let it go yeah. and be able to be I think yeah. it's just strong through your whole yeah. your whole person yeah. needs to be strong and I think mm-hmm. some people forget that I think they go you know I sit there and say it a lot of the time be strong through your pregnancy so you have a strong birth people are like actually what does that mean and what that's that mean? what that means yeah exactly yeah. and it's just better outcomes you're, you're, the evidence is strong if you are stronger and you exercise and you keep active through pregnancy yes there is outliers you can be as strong as ever and as fit as ever and have, totally. have a terrible birth and, and these things can happen which you know birth trauma is very very real totally but evidence is there you are less likely to have those less things likely. and that's the thing. as a general population yeah. like mm-hmm. we're not saying this is never going to eliminate no, everything absolutely not it's birth mm. yep fucking shit goes shit wrong shit can happen <laughs> yeah i am i have witnessed that shit literally time. happens literally <laughs> but i think if we can reduce the risk of that happening absolutely and like this is the thing like i go into all of my births going well i'm the fittest strongest person i can mm-hmm. be mentally and physically and then the rest is just to the baby absolutely. the baby takes over yeah. baby takes over the natural being the hormones yeah all of the things yeah. take over but if i can go in being the best version of that. And look, I know you and me talk about it a lot, but not to mention the importance of working out during pregnancy for our mental health. Oh, I, I, I couldn't have not. I mean, I was pregnant during COVID, so I couldn't go to the gym, no. which sucked. But I'd done my online classes, so I ran online classes for our, you know, patients in our clinic. Yeah. That kept me sane. Totally. Kept me sane. Had yeah. to get out there and walk. Yeah. yeah. Had to get out there and run. Yeah. After 21 weeks, like, <laughs> it was just too big. So pre-pregnancy, obviously getting tumor with your pelvic floor, mm-hmm. even see someone. Pregnancy... Just get strong. Get strong. See a pelvic floor therapist. Get strong and then learn how to breathe. Yep. And then the other cheeky little one that I do is I, I want everyone to put arches in their shoes and keep their arches. Oh. It's a bit random. You're very right. Uh, you've got lots of different hormones going through your body. It relaxes and helps you, you know, your pelvis start to widen and everything like that. Yeah. What I find with a lot of women clinically in my practice is that not only do they you know, start to open here, the arches can collapse a little oh, bit. Okay. Yeah, your foot gets like a little yeah. bit bigger after pregnancy and stuff. Yeah. And a lot of that kind of rolling in, I mean, your feet, your feet and pelvic floor is hugely related as well. The body, oh, body is wow. a unit. Yeah. And if your kind of feet are kind of dipping in, you get this kind of internal rotation through here and you can load up. So for those with pelvic girdle pain, little arch in your shoe. Oh, beautiful. That's yeah. a great yeah. tip. Get a little tip, get it straight okay. in. Okay, love that one. And, and then post- for postpartum, keep yeah. them in until your first menstrual cycle. Right, okay. Yeah. All right, so then postpartum, mm-hmm. what are your top tips? Postpartum, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You don't have to beat everyone and get back into it straight away. Yeah. Every person is different. Yeah. Take into account what your birth looked like and everything. But you can start with pelvic floor, breathing, and activations a day after giving birth. Yeah. Breathe. Yeah. Your diaphragm's been shunted right up here. Yeah. Literally lie there and think about breathing. Yeah. Not like this. Yeah. Think about breathing. That can yeah. be from the get go. Don't wait till the six weeks. Yeah. I do remember having my harper and the next day trying to turn off my pelvic floor though and being like, Where's it where's it where's it, it gone? Let's see. I mean it's been stretched to <laughs> if you've delivered vaginally, it can be stretched up to three times its yeah, size. Wow. Like how fucking cool is that? It's, Are we not the best ever? Yeah. Post cesarean as well. You've had however many layers cut through. Yeah. It's massive, yeah. but you can still breathe. Yeah. You know, we talk about don't lift weights, don't lift a weight until you've been six weeks oh. after. Well, you're you're lifting a baby. Yeah. You're getting out of bed. So you're getting in and out of the car. All of that requires strength. Yeah. So all of that can be done really, yeah, get onto it straight Safely. away. Yeah. yeah. Don't wait to six weeks. Obviously, listen to your own body. Yes. I'm not telling you to get out there and start, yeah. start running six weeks, but I mean as in you can start those things early. A yeah. lot of women in my practice don't do anything until they've seen a GP and then the yeah. GP doesn't really do anything. And I see, I get that as well if I have consults with women who want to do coaching with me. They go, oh, I'm only four weeks postpartum, so I'm not doing anything yet. I'm like, yeah. I'm yeah, so I think it's just do. so, it's such a conflicting scared. information. And they're scared. Yeah. Go and see someone that has got further training that can advise you on your body and what you should be able to do. Yeah. Mm. Is there anything you advise people not to do while I'm pregnant to reduce the risk of prolapse and pelvic floor? As you know, I'm a runner and I'm still running mm-hmm. since pregnancy, but I have definitely leaked mm. all this pregnancy that I'd never elected the twins' pregnancy. I think yeah. I just said, you know, my first leakage was a year postpartum. I did run Melbourne. So I had the twins in the August. I did a half marathon 16 weeks post with no pelvic floor issues at all. Mm-hmm. And then for whatever reason, by the time one year postpartum came and I did run Melbourne, I did a PB half, so quite running quite fast, and I – <laughs> weed. Oh, yeah. I was like, yep. oh, hi. Yes. Yep. What are you doing here? Like I'm a year postpartum. Yep. And then haven't really had any issues till I became in this pregnancy. And this pregnancy is 
definitely different. Like I still feel like it's quite strong. I don't know. Mm. If, yeah, but I don't know if it's. <laughs> yeah, I think this is really you can't we can't generalize this yeah. because I think everybody is just so different. Yeah. So some people do say no running. Some people say no running, and I think that's outdated for someone like yourself who's been an avid runner. Yeah, who is strong, who does do the work. Yeah, then absolutely you can continue that. Yeah, I wouldn't be upping your intensity well, no. or making your pace quicker or doing extra sessions a week. You no. would probably modify those things. Yeah, you know. Take the pace up a little bit. Um, Things like that, you know, like in anything, like not, I'm not talking about it as if it's an injury as such because it's not your pregnant, but go a little bit slower. Don't go as far. Mm. Don't go as often. Yeah. Do it in the morning. Your pelvic floor won't be as tired. So you might be more fatigued towards the end of the day, taking all of those things into account. Yeah. Again, I think everyone's different. Yeah. So if you are experiencing leaking, if you are experiencing pain, heaviness, bulging, anything like that, That's when I'd look at kind of minimizing yeah. it and going, do I need to be running? Could I be going on a quick walk? Could I be doing an intense yeah. workout? Yeah. For example. Yeah. Yeah. But some, you know, body weight, low oh, absolutely exercise. Yeah. If you're lying on the couch for nine weeks. Totally. No. And that was the other thing. I think, you know, going back to what you said earlier about you can't start anything new while you're pregnant. Yeah. And people say, oh, but I haven't, I stopped working out six weeks prior because I was trying to get pregnant. I'm like, why would you stop working out six weeks mm-hmm. prior? I haven't worked out for six weeks. Or haven't people do everything? And we know that exercise has no yeah, impact at impact. all. Or on miscarriage as well, which is another mm-hmm. thing, you know, uh, especially for someone who has four miscarriages. And my first one, I was like, oh, maybe it's because I exercised. And that's where it gets really tricky and we can get a bit lost in it. I, you know, I've got friends who are struggling to conceive and you kind of just go, I'm going to do everything in my power to get this. And you kind of, you go on it with blinkers. I don't want to do anything. Those things that I think might be risky. Yeah. Yeah. It's tricky and it's touchy, but the evidence is there. If you're exercising, preconception, and it does help. Yeah. yeah. And you can start, you know, and that's why I have my pregnancy program. Yeah. You can absolutely start mm-hmm. those while you're, mm-hmm. like, if you have never exercised yeah. before. Um, most of them are between 10 and 20 minutes long. Yeah. Yeah. They're perfect long, amount of time. Perfect amount of time. They're low intensity. Yeah. Just do 10 minutes if you want. Absolutely. You don't have to do the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. That's it. You yeah. know. Yeah. Amazing. So basically there's nothing you shouldn't be doing. Not really. really. Not. Generally? Generally, yeah. Specifically to the person, maybe. Yeah. 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 Again, you're not going to like, oh, I'm pregnant, let's train for a marathon. No. Yeah. As I said, like I continued to sprint and do like high intensity stuff up till about 21 weeks and I just couldn't anymore because it was too painful. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. So, you know, I've, you I've reeled that in. Yeah, listen sure. to your body. Yeah. yeah. And same with weights as well. So, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I So I was squatting probably about 60 kilos before I was – Yeah pregnant this time and I have to drop down to just squatting 40 kilos from here yeah. now as long as you've got as is long it, as every time you squat you're not down? leaking no if you can still maintain that strength and you can still contain and do the same movement patterns and it looks good and you're activating everything yeah. and you're not getting any pain or leaking yeah right hmm, cool why not well it's almost a bit late now yeah, yeah. a bit late now just leave it just, just leave it at 40, 40. <laughs> my pancake butt can yeah exactly yeah. Wait later. amazing yeah. I love this conversation. I know. So I, I can like, talk about it for hours and that? days and I've probably forgotten lots of things that I wanted to say. Yeah. But yeah. If I, anyone has any questions, I can definitely. Yeah, totally. Well, do you want to tell everyone where they can find you, where they can contact you? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm at the Osteopathic Clinic in Altona in Melbourne's West. I've got the Osteopathic Clinic Instagram. I've also got an Instagram that I told you that I've got, but I've got no followers because I've got too much um, <laughs> imposter syndrome to start. Just start. I know, just yeah. start. But, yeah. yeah, I will start. I will start one. Yeah, yeah, so that I can have – I just want people being educated and informed and feeling strong and powerful yeah. and knowing that they can heal and they can get better and it's not normal. It's common, but it's not normal. Yeah. And, you know, you can get your function back. Totally. Yeah. So if you are not in Melbourne, reach out to LJ and you can probably mm. help find someone in the area as well yeah absolutely um, yeah but, yeah reach out reach yeah, out to the really clinic like. and i can guide you on a therapist that's close to you as well yeah and mm-hmm. everyone's vagina is different everybody's vulva sorry is vulva different. <laughs> is different fanny <laughs> collective fanny. term collective term fanny everybody's different that's that's okay they're all beautiful i got told the other day that fanny is very english apparently but i was like doesn't fanny mean bum though in, in america oh, fanny. oh that's american yeah, yeah. okay yeah yeah yep Anyway, thanks. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If something resonated with you, click follow so you don't miss the next episode and send me a DM on Instagram at the figure underscore. It means the world to me to know that you're loving these episodes. If you're wanting more accountability and tools to implement changes in your life, head to the link in the show notes and book a free call with me. And if you want to get started right now, download our free resource, Five Simple Things That Will Change Your Life. I can't wait to be back in your life next week. And trust me, you won't want to miss this episode.